Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 150, featuring an interview with Shane R. Monroe, the guy who was doing retro gaming podcasts before anybody had ever heard of a podcast and before retro gaming was considered cool. He's a great guy, one of my inspirations. It's a great pleasure to get to sit down with him. Now, since I'd already interviewed uh, Shane, about his uh, background and how he got to be where he was, I decided to uh, take this opportunity to discuss a topic uh, that's very near and dear to both of us, namely piracy. Got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Shane R. Monroe. All right, folks, I'm here with Shane R. Monroe, the man behind a passenger seat radio, retro gaming radio, and uh, the Review Lagoon. It's uh, great to have you here, Shane. How are you doing? Man, it's great to be here. It's uh, nice to be on the other end of this interview thing for a change. <laughs> it's very liberating. Yeah, so I thought I'd do something uh, a little bit different with this uh, uh, with this episode. I wanted to focus in on a on an issue. Um, the issue being uh, piracy and all the issues surrounding piracy. It's kind of a. I feel like as retro gamers, we're in a unique situation because we have to uh, find a way to emulate you know a lot of these sure. older games, and that can be a problem. But I just wanted to get your take uh, first of all on. Uh, uh, what do you think about these torrent sites, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer sites, uh, this uh, whole Kim, what's his name, Kim.com? Yeah, Kim.com. <laughs> the mega upload thing. I mean, do you see this as uh, something uh, we should be concerned about, or are these just uh, thieves and criminals? Oh, you know, I think... Um... <clears throat> I think Mega Upload was the uh, was really the patsy. They were the people that they wanted to put on display. Somebody had to be made an example of, right? And uh, I think Mega Upload really was really the ones that did it. I mean, Mega Upload uh, was also, from what I understand anyway, from what I've read, uh, they were involved in some other stuff, right? They were involved in money laundering and some other probably things that, you know, piracy really wasn't the biggest thing on the market you know, that they were shopping for. So I think that um, as a bonus, uh, the U.S. government not only had the opportunity to make a big piracy example, but they got to take down somebody who was probably, yeah, they were probably bad guys. They were probably doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing. Um, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the fact that um, uh, these people that are providing host, uh, hosting services, these clouds, the um, the file sharing services, they really, I really don't think they should be being held responsible for what's put in their storage, uh, their storage areas. Um, I mean, I think that's, you know, I mean, if, if I went right down to the storage shed down the street and I opened up half of those things, I'm sure I would find things in there that were probably illegal right now. If there's a half a pound of blow sitting in one side of those lockers, am I going to take the storage guy to prison for it? Probably not. Right. He's not responsible for what's in that storage unit. So, that's kind of how I feel about it. I think the guys, uh, I think this particular piece of the equation, the piracy piece of it's really not what brought them down, but it was a very nice thing to put on the bullet list. Yeah, it seems kind of, uh, you know, the same thing with uh, the Pirate Bay, you know, all of these sort of torrent sites. You know, I, I can sort of see sometimes where the, uh, where the, uh, I guess it's the uh, MPA, what's the movie? Uh, MPAA, right? MPAA, and these guys are coming from. I mean, are these sites are making money with advertising, right? Is it? They make money with advertising. Some of them make money with um, uh, with uh, membership, right? Some of them charge some sort of a fee to access their services, uh, and that's uh, you know, again, that goes right back to, um, you know, what if there's a drug dealer that stores their stuff in the storage shed down the street, right? Uh, the guy who's storing the drugs is making money on it. Yeah, uh, but I mean, what if uh, you know? Would anybody go to Pirate Bay? If you couldn't get illegal, uh, right. you know, files. I mean, do you think these guys, I mean, they can claim that, oh, we're only dealing with a legitimate use. Public domain public software. Do you know, this is all public domain. I mean, come yeah. on. I mean, We expect you to be, well, you, you know, it, there's obviously there is um, uh, a misuse of of that facility, right? They um, they made it very simple. What, what the biggest argument is, is they made it very simple for people to share pirated software and profit from the pirated software's distribution that's probably that's probably skating the gray line i personally again holding them responsible for this what's on there isn't as big of a deal as is the behavior that is being accepted um and again uh if let's say for example i set up a paypal account and i said listen if you send me a dollar i will let you get an mp3 out of my dropbox <laughs> I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got a selection yeah. of public domain music in my Dropbox, and if you put a dollar in my PayPal account, I will give you a link to that Dropbox. So if I did that, 
Is PayPal responsible? Is Dropbox responsible? You know, they know there's illegal stuff in there. They can't police it. YouTube has millions of illegal files up there. They are, you know, we do our best effort to take those off. But in reality, they're still hosting illegal content just as much as mega upload, maybe even more than mega upload was. Who knows? Um, Because those numbers are very hard to define. But uh, these, um, it's a gray area. Somebody has to set precedence. And unfortunately, this might be the case that does it, which is sad because it's not about the piracy. People say, well, they, you know, they were condoning piracy. So that's why they got shut down. Now, if there hadn't been money laundering and the coke smuggling and all this other crap that they're saying that these guys did, uh, I don't think that they would have been the first target, nor would it have been such a heavy handed blow either. Um, but that's just, that's just my opinion. I don't have any, you know, factual basis for that. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned that they're hosting these files, but they're actually, I was just reading that Pirate Bay apparently has replaced all of their regular torrent links with these things called magnet links. No, I've not really, read about this one now. I don't really know uh, much about it, but apparently it's some <laughs> system, so instead of hosting the torrents themselves, this is a way to actually right. spread that out, you know, so they'll be uh, uh, less liable. But, I mean, it just, it's not, it's called the Pirate Bay. Well, you know, that's the sort of, you know, flagrancy that gets so many people into trouble, you know. Uh, and, you know, I think there was, I think that there almost became a um, romantic engagement with piracy in general. Uh, not just piracy, but real piracy, like pirates on a ship that are going around. It's crazy. If you look right now, there's Lego Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean is a huge movie. Kids can go out and buy pirate outfits at your local store. You know, this this has been romanticized, right? And I think even the concept of piracy, not that there's any real correlation between a pirate arg and, you know, pirate, give me a copy of that disc. But I think there's a romantic uh, there's a romantic sentiment behind it as well that um, uh, this uh, social order of everything's free, entitlement. Uh, I, I talk a lot about this right on my shows, the generation gimme, the entitlement phase that people are going through right now, this Generation X or the millennials, whatever you call them. They have this huge entitlement piece, and for them, it, it's all about free. They grew up; their first thing was Napster, right? Napster was just like this—you know, you know what Napster was. Everyone knows what Napster was. They, they, they cut their teeth on free music, and when you're cutting your teeth on that, everything else should be free too. And they, they really have no—they uh, have no morals about it. To them, it's like if you have something I want, I'll just take it, and if you don't stop me, then I deserve it. My wife teaches high school. They they deal with she deals with this all the time. Theft between students. It's incredible. Theft of her stuff by the students, and they have no remorse or conscience about it. I mean, weren't we doing the same thing though back in the day? I mean, I had I don't know how many mixtapes and you know, your song a good song comes on the radio, you record it. I mean, that these people would probably view that back then the same uh, way they view the stuff going on now. Oh, and, and let's not let's not gloss over the concept of what piracy is, right? And maybe maybe what's useful is we sit here and talk about what is piracy. Every single person, probably on the planet, bar none, is guilty of piracy in one way or another. Uh, the simple act of taking your DVD, making a copy of it, so you can put it in the in the van, so your kids on a long trip get to watch without stomping all over the disc when it kicks out. It's piracy. There's no way around it. That's piracy. When you're recording something off the radio, like you said, piracy. When you're converting a Blu-ray to a DVD, a Blu-ray you own, that's piracy. And you're violating, you know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You can go to prison, blah, blah, blah. I mean, every half the damn things we do, people who will take a picture off of a website and put it in a global distribution email, they're not permission to, to publish that. That's piracy. I mean, where do you actually start saying, you know, this is hardcore piracy, like, you know, downtown Malaysia, where they're actually handing out bootlegs of Star Wars in 3D already, and it hasn't even hit the theater yet. Or is it, um, you know, Bob who loaned his copy of Office to his nephew so that he could uh, install it for free? You know, I really like what you said about the entitled. I was, you know, thinking about this entitlement, you know, you're talking about before. Sure. I mean, uh, let's just say I knew a guy, you know, back in the... <laughs> 80s and 90s, it did a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you get the the boxes of discs with uh, sure. handwritten labels on them and all this stuff. Uh, but uh, he w- I don't think this uh, guy would have called himself a pirate. You know, that would have been something that they, you know, the industry might have called this person, but the person would have said, no, I'm a, I just trade software. 
Yeah, and and back in the old, um, well, you you you're probably familiar with this. Back in the old user group days, user groups always started off with the best intentions. Hey, come on down. We're going to get a bunch of guys together. We all have Commodore sixty fours. We're going to show you the newest software. You know, Bob just got a copy of this thing. Uh, you know, he bought it. He bought this. Uh, you know, Geos one twenty eight. He's going to show us how this new operating system works. We're going to talk about this. We're going to have a guest speaker, and then we're going to you know f- you know fraternize at the end of the thing. Next thing you know, the whole thing turns into a copy party. Everybody just shows up with like a, a truckload of freaking Banff discs, backs it, boop, 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 and like dumps like five boxes <laughs> of like floppies. There's like 71541s all across the desks. They're all paired up running fast hacking. <laughs> so I'm told. And they have these, you know, and these things are just running as disk duplicators. That's what, it, that's what the user groups turned out as. They called, then they became swap parties, copy parties. Uh, so uh, this is not a very new thing at all, right? Uh, any, any, the first time medium came out, it started being bootlegged, uh, r- record companies in, um, music, uh, stations, radio stations, they bootleg all the time. Local talent releases a record. It gets exciting. It gets hot. They bootleg it. They stick it on a network and they send it over to their buddies in New York or other markets. Commonplace. Uh, so, so piracy is rampant, no matter what you look and whatever media you choose to pick it's, it's out there and it's, it's being done. I guess the real question is, is, um, uh, is, is, is proving damage at this point, right? I mean, that's really where the crime happens is who is being harmed, who's being damaged. And is there really this unbelievable, um, meteoric loss of revenue? I think that's really the, 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 the piece of piracy we should really look at. Is there harm? Some people even say piracy helps the industry. I mean, you can, you can pull an article off of, uh, just about any, uh, major tech site and they'll tell you right up front, Hey, you know what? Here's CEO of, you know, some indie game company that says, yeah, we love people to pirate our stuff. It's the best way we get exposure. We can't run full page ads in the mags like EA, but piracy helps us. You know, it's, it's a very convoluted topic. You know, I got two things that I'd like to, you know, to comment. Uh, one is uh, that if you look, I was just reading an article that said historically the United States uh, publishing industry would have never got off the ground if it hadn't been for piracy. Uh, they were able to make all their money pirating uh, Charles Dickens and all these uh, British authors. Right. <laughs> you know, that they makes didn't pay total Charles sense. Dickens a penny. You know, they just take no. his uh, stuff and print it and you know and, and then sell it. You know, now uh, China's doing the same thing to us and we're getting all uh, you know pretentious and you know self-righteous about this. So Of course. Well, yeah, it's all fun. It's all fun and games when you're the one benefiting from it. As soon as you're become the victim of it, now all of a sudden it's, you know, this huge crime, everyone's going to go to hell or prison or both, you know, prison first, then hell, you know, take your pick. <laughs> it's really true. I mean, the same people, <laughs> the same people that hire lawyers to sue Motorola for a patent violation, the same people that um, go out and bust 13 year old girls who are copying music across Napster. These are the same guys that go right back to their office, hire lawyers to find loopholes, st- fail to pay millions in taxes, you know, get away with toxic dumping. Y- you name the crime. These guys are crying because we're copying a disc or, uh, you know, people are sharing music. These guys are committing real crimes, you know, crimes that actually kill fish and destroy ecosystems. And, you know, they've got Chinese laborers jumping off the freaking buildings into nets because these guys want to commit suicide because they're making a dollar an hour putting iPods together. You know, I think there's bigger fish to fry. Now, do I think that, um, you know, like Pirate Bay, I mean, like I said, the blatancy of that, right? Pirate Bay, Malaysia, right? Malaysia, China, for crying out loud, there's like a Wii, uh, Wii U remote already made in China that's got an Android operating system on it. But you look at it and you go, this is a Wii, you know, this is a Wii U remote. This is unbelievable. And they prey on, uh, you know, that market recognition. The whole The whole world's corrupt and filled with horrible things. But I don't know where I was going with that, but. I was on it's, a good. Yeah, I was on it's a hard good to role, feel so. sorry for these guys. I mean, <laughs> it it's, really it's, is. They're corporates. They're millionaires, and they're, nobody likes them. You know, so why should we feel sorry for them? Well, you know, and that's no excuse, right? I mean, there there is the thing. It's like, well, they don't need the money. Well, okay, that that may be true, right? But if you were the guy with all the money, would you be in the same situation, right? I think that there's. Um, I think that there are people from the previous generations. The uh, old money, right? The old money that um, that might actually m- more subscribe to these sort of models 
because that's what they're used to, right? In the old days, I was reading a really interesting um, article on copy protection on the Commodore 64 from the old days, and they were talking to the authors. These guys work both ends of the field. It's fantastic. These guys would go to um, EA and Activision and write these horrifying protection schemes for these guys, and then turn right around and release Cracker Jacks and, and you know, Fast Hack and Parameter Copy. They were playing the both. the same guys? It's the same guys. <laughs> yeah, so after I was done working on Cracker Jacks, I would go to my day job and work you know, on EA and, and help them make, you know, uncrackable software. And it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> right. What's that all about? I remember I just interviewed David uh, Fox from uh, Lucasfilm. We talked about this a little bit and he said that uh, he really thought that he thought they really bungled the whole thing because what they did with the copy protection was it was a challenge. Right. You know, and you're putting this out there. Hey, I bet you guys can't crack this. And of course, what's going to happen? And within, <laughs> you know, two days. <laughs> That's definitely another side of the argument, right? The, the more the heavy, the more heavy protection you put, the more of a challenge. And yeah, I'm not sure there's a lot of credence in that, right? Um, if you put a type in the type in the word copy protection, you know, old school, you know, fit, flip the code wheel, you know, line it up, black on black print. Um, is that really? Is that going to get? Is, is, are the hackers going to say, nah, I can do that. I'll just leave that one alone. You go ahead and sell 500,000 copies and we'll leave that one alone. Hey, now this other one, though, that uses a dongle, I'm going to take that one. Nah, they're going to crack it. I mean, it's it's a, it's not a matter of how, how gruesome you make it. Sure, I'm sure there's a challenge behind it and the, the hackers like that. But it's not, you know, not putting any protection on is not going to decrease the amount of, of um, distribution or copying that's going to happen. It's... It's a nice romantic, and again, it's a nice romantic sentiment. You know, if we make this really easy, they're not even going to bother. No, they're going to bother. <laughs> you know, I haven't interviewed any crackers. You know, it might be something fun to, you know, to, <laughs> to find there's somebody. There's tons of, there's tons of interviews, uh, textual online. It'd be really great to get one of these guys like Jim Drew. Now, I actually met, do you know who Jim Drew is? No, no, no. Jim Drew was responsible for all the greatest, uh, enhancement hardware in the Commodore 64 day. Um, they made discs that were uncopyable. They made actual discs that you can only duplicate in the factory if you took it back to any Commodore 64, regardless of what software you had, there was no possible way to copy it. And they did that They did that by actually slowing the drives down manually to make these copies. They had, they had these bulk machines that would make these discs, but they would actually slow the drives down, something that you couldn't physically do at home. So it was the best possible protection, right? And so what this guy did is he actually went in, disassembled the entire chipset out of the 1541 disk drive and made his own enhanced ROM set for it. He got rid of all the crap, all the things that make the 1541 slow. He knocked them out. He made it so fast. Uh, Jiffy DOS was something he did. Um, uh, Rombo, I think he did the ROM board as well. He did a whole bunch of these things and they were all these insane boards. You put them in your 1541 and it was like suddenly... You were like a god. You could do anything. You could disassemble a disc without even having it hooked up to a computer. And so this guy, this guy knew everything about everything. He knew every single copy protection. This kid, this is a young kid. The, when he put out all this stuff, the guy was like 18 years old. And uh, he, uh, an amazing guy. I got to meet him. I got to talk to him. This was, of course, before I was, you know, doing podcasts. I was like 12 or something. And uh, the guy was just an amazing piece of work. But you don't look at this guy, you know, you expect to see him in this dark trench coat with a hat pulled down over his eyes. And, you know, he's holding up his jacket. Hey, buddy, you want to buy a disc? You know? <clears throat> yeah. Hey, you want a ROM board? Hey, look, I got Jiffy Dots right here, pal. Regular guy, right? And, but this guy was so knowledgeable. And you could just sit here, like, mesmerized listening to him. And there's interviews with him and a bunch of the other guys that he worked with all online that you can go and read. And it's fascinating to see the, the constant struggle that they went through the ones that weren't playing both sides, of course, because that was like the best. Uh, but so, you know, this is not a new thing at all. Uh, Macrovision started off very early. A lot of people don't realize uh, video video cassette tapes became protected with Macrovision. And that Macrovision is still around today working as um, uh, encryptors of DVD and, and other uh, video content. But those guys go back a long way. You're talking like early 80s that uh, these guys have been around trying to stop people from copying stuff. And it just doesn't stop them. <laughs> There's always a way around it. So, are you the type of guy, uh, Shane, that will just flat out refuse to buy a game if it's got some type of an intrusive uh, DRM scheme? That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, Skyrim's a great example, right? Um, I really wanted to play Skyrim, and uh, my choices were to play it on the 360, which I did not feel was draconian, um, or you know, not play it. the The PC version. I don't like being tied to to, to services. 
I don't have a particular issue on privacy. Uh, it's like, well, you know, Steam is a big privacy thing. No, I don't care about that. I care that the, the that what I purchase, that the disc that I buy today will run tomorrow. I'm a nostalgia guy. I believe that everybody in 20 years from their 16th birthday is going to look back and say, man, I really wish I could play that game again. I really wish I could hear that song again. I really wish I could see that TV show again because it really made an impact on me. Those are the years of your life that things impact you. They say that you develop your own taste of music at 14 years old. Right. So you listen to what your mom and your dad listen to up to then, but then you develop your own taste. So 14, 15, 16, 17, these are the years that you develop and become an individual. These are the things that in 20 years from now you want to revisit. You know, the midlife starts creeping in. It's like, I want to go back and reflect on my life. Oh, OMD. Oh, yeah, right? So you look back and you're thinking, God, I, I, I want to play this game again. I want to play, uh, you know, uh, David was just talking on the thing. I want to play, I want to play Lemmings on a touchscreen. I think being able to play Amiga Lemmings on a touchscreen would be fantastic. I want to be able to play Dragon's Lair like it was intended to be. If we get to a point to where there's no more physical media, no more physical media that, uh, or, or no more content that doesn't exist without gruesome draconian DRM protection that calls back to servers. Anything that stops you from using your content without their existence in the future, that's a horrible thing, right? I, I just posted something about um, some Sony online service that sold people a bunch of virtual like Magic the Gathering cards. These guys spent hundreds of bucks. They're closing the server. You got nothing. You got nothing. They don't even send you a printout of these things. You're done. It's over. And the disposable nature of our society, everybody wants to stream everything. Nobody wants to actually buy a disc anymore. They want to turn on Netflix. These sort of things are going to bite them in the ass. Oh, can I say ass? Is that a <laughs> you can Say whatever you want to say. <laughs> yeah, it's just we, crazy. So, but you know, and what what I really hate about it is it it kills uh, the used games uh, stores. You know, they say in a couple of generations everything will be downloaded. And you know, you. Know, Steam, you know, basically is the future. So that's, right. you know, say goodbye to uh, buying a game for a reasonable price in a bargain bin somewhere, right? Well, here's the here's sort of my thought process on that. A lot of people say that it's here right now. It's like, oh, well, you know, physical media is dead. You know, nobody wants to buy discs anymore. Well, that's just not true. Um, we have a, right now, prolifically speaking, Generation X, that's you and me, um, our generation is in control. Right. Old man money stepping down. You know, the baby boomers are on their way out. Those guys are even worse than we are. Those guys want to have, you know, you know, a chicken in every pot. And I mean, they've got some very old school mentality going on. Our group is still is still looking at physical media. That's why a lot of people's like, well, you know, the TV people aren't giving us what we want. The movie companies aren't giving us what we want. We don't want discs. We want online streaming. We want it yesterday. The day that movie comes out, we want to have it on our computer. And Generation X, that's not us. We we want the disc. We want to open it. We want to touch. We want to smell. We want to open a Commodore 64 <laughs> box and go. Ah, there is, to us, there's value in that, to Generation X. We're in charge. Until we're not in charge, physical media is not going anywhere. Now, there will be alternatives. There will be the streaming. There will be subscription contents. There will be all the download stuff. Until Gen X is out of the equation, until we are not in charge, I think digital media has got plenty of future left. So that gives us, what, 20 years? That, that's, that's a long time, right? So I think, I think that's safe for now. But I dread the day, I truly dread the day when the first the first time something comes out and they say flat out, it will never be on a piece of media. You will not be able to get this on a DVD, a Blu-ray, uh, Blu-ray 2X or whatever it is that's out in 20 years. And they say, listen, from that this, to this point forward, this movie will never be available anywhere else but from our system where you have to scan your fingerprint at the door if you ever want to watch it. That will be a sad day. That will be a very sad day. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Shane R. Monroe. And I'm going to post some links to uh, Shane's websites where you can check out his various podcasts. And I especially recommend his old retro gaming radio stuff. Some of the best shows I've ever heard on the internet, and especially when it comes to retro gaming. So take my advice, check those out. You'll be glad that you did. As always, I want to thank you if you have uh, supported the show, and if you have, uh, please stick around. There's something very special for you at the end of the episode. If you haven't, though, don't worry. You can still do so at armchairarcade.com, and maybe at episode 200, I'll have something for you. But anyway, thanks, everybody, for being so generous and supportive of the show. Now, what about that ale of the week? Now, for this week's ale, I have another one of Herbert's specials. This is a porter 
just called Porter. It is brewed by the, oh my God, I never know how to pronounce this, Brewer J, Brewer J, <laughs> Brewery, uh, De Molen. It is uh, based in the Netherlands, so this one might be familiar to uh, all of you Netherlands guys. Uh, certain Mr. Mark here might have come across this one. Uh, let's see, imported by the Shelton Brothers, see so if we can learn anything about it. English hops, bittering hops, Kent Goldberg, and final hops, hoppy, hoppy, hop, hop. Uh, bottled 2011, apparently this will be good for five years. If kept cool and dark, I don't think we're going to keep it waiting that long, though, do you? <laughs> let's see. 5.8% uh, alcohol, so not bad. And it's a porter, which is one of my favorites. So let's get this open and see what this porter is all about. All right, let's get her open. I ah, love that. Never gets old. Let's pour some in the old drinking horn. This time, doing it very slowly. I don't want to repeat of last week. Unfortunately, I again poured with a bit too much haste. As you can see, there's <laughs> quite a bit of foam in the old horn. I had to wait a good five or six minutes for the foam to die down. I've really got to work on my pouring technique. Huh? Well, anyway, here's a toast to you, uh, Mr. Herbert. Hope you're having a great day. I know I'm about to start one. Let me give this a smell first. Ah, it smells so good. Kind of a chocolatey, coffee, kind of little cherry. Really nice uh, smell on this one. Kind of, uh, kind of pumped about it. Let me give it a taste, though. Ah, that is nice. Uh, kind of chocolatey, kind of a, a nutty-like taste. Uh, kind of like a Guinness, I guess, if you are, are familiar with that one, which I hope that you are. I'll give it another another taste here. Yeah, this is uh, very, very drinkable. It's almost like a chocolate milk, yoo-hoo, kind of chocolate soldier kind of a thing. Uh, very, very drinkable. Um, you can't really taste any alcohol or any bitterness. Just a really smooth, really uh, delicious porter. And I thank you very much, Herbert, uh, for drawing this one to my attention. Thank you very much, sir. Now let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And uh, this quotation comes from the land of Czechoslovakia. From Czechoslovakia. How do you say that? Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and this quotation comes from Czechos Czechoslovakia. And this one comes from the land of the Czechs. And this quotation comes from Czechoslovakia. And it goes something like this. A fine ale can be judged with just one sip. But it's better to be thoroughly sure. See you guys next week.
he just kind of shoulder shrugged it off. Uh, the rat jumped off, and he went back to sleep. Like, it was so routine for him. He went right back to sleep.